please welcome Paul van Greensven, who will tell us what's needed to create a very responsive, playable, playable third-person character. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, really appreciate it. Welcome to Player Traversal Mechanics in the vast world of Horizon Zero Dawn. My name is Paul van Grinsven and I'm a game programmer at Guerrilla. Probably all of you have already seen a lot of footage of Horizon and maybe some of you have actually played it, but let me start by showing a short video of the ver various traversal mechanics that will be handled during this presentation. So who is this flamed-haired female warrior? Who are we dealing with? Let me introduce to you Aloy, a tribal outcast searching to understand her origins. She's an adventurer with a lot of agility and endurance. Growing up in the wild and years of training made her into a very strong climber with very well-developed fighting and hunting skills. The world of Horizon is huge and most of the terrain is procedurally generated. The world supports a lot of different ecotopes. There's a large variety of rivers, forest, vegetation, climates, and wildlife. Next to that, the world is also filled with man-made structures and settlements, both indoor as well as outdoor. All of this makes it quite challenging for a game programmer to implement a solid traversal system. So now that you had a small introduction to Horizon, let's have a very quick look on what will be covered during this presentation. I will explain very briefly what the goals and constraints were for the traversal mechanics, a short look at our tools, workflow and animation pipeline. Then we will start off with in-depth descriptions of our more advanced traversal mechanics and I will end some time for questions and answers. To begin with, I would like to say a few things about the goals and constraints that we had for play traversal at the start of the project. From the design point of view, the overall requirement was to have responsive and fluid movement. Horizon is an open world action RPG, so responsiveness has a big influence on the actual gameplay. The traversal development team consists of two programmers, three animators, one designer and one producer. And from a technical point of view, everything needed to run at a minimum of 30 FPS. And as the terrain is mostly procedurally generated, we also had to make sure that all the movement would work properly everywhere in the world, no matter where you are. At Gorilla, our animators work with both Maya as well as Motion Builder. Morpheme is used as an animation middleware consi consisting of an animation altering application Morpheme Connect and a runtime engine. Morpheme Connect allows our animators to graphically alter blend trees, state machines and transition logic. All this animation behavior for a character is stored in an animation network. The Morpheme runtime code that is integrated into our Decima engine then takes care of instantiating such animation networks and handles the runtime playback. The Decima engine is our own in-house developed engine, consisting of an editor and a runtime. The Decima editor is our authoring tool that allows users to graphically build huge and dynamic game worlds, including all systems and logic. Within Morpheme, each animation clip can be annotated with events, which have a time, a duration and an ID. The animators can control when and for how long events are active and how events are blended together with multiple animations. Morpheme Runtime will provide a list of currently active events to the game after each update. This is an important tool for the game logic to synchronize its own state with the animation network. We wanted the world of Horizon to have a lot of similarities with our current world, covering a lot of different landscapes. The image on the slide shows a typical traversable area in Horizon, and you can see a lot of differences in elevation in the terrain. And unlike the Dutch landscape I'm used to, it's not flat at all. During this presentation, I will explain the various mechanics that we have developed that will allow Aloy, here standing in the middle, to reach the far right of the screen. 
While Aloy is traversing our world, it's not only small differences in elevation that she will encounter, as shown on the image. She also has to deal with blocking obstacles like rocks, broken trees, robot parts, etc. As Aloy is very agile, we wanted her to effortlessly traverse most obstacles on her way, and so the Vault system was born. Our Vault system is capable of performing three types of moves. We support step up, step over, and step off. The detection distances and parameters that are used are dependent on the current type of movement. For example, swimming or sprinting have different detection settings compared to normal walking. In the vault system, the first step is to see if we are actually allowed to vault. Our level designers can disable vaulting in certain gameplay areas by placing trigger volumes. Besides that, individual game assets can also be marked as not vaultable, for example, a table with a pickup on top of it. If the player is allowed to vault, we start by scheduling collision probes. And to prevent us from having to waste precious cycles while waiting for the probe results, we decided to probe async. The collision probes are scheduled so they can be executed on different threads later in the frame. However, this means that the results of our probes are lagging one frame as we have to wait for the frame to be finished to gather our results. So, moving on to the next frame, we are now able to process the results from previous frame. The collision probe that we scheduled is a swept sphere intersection test in front of Aloy. The probe starts at the standing eye height and ends a few meters below the starting point. If the intersection point of the swept sphere is higher than our current position, it means we should start analyzing the obstacle shape for a possible step up or step over. If the intersection point has a horizontal offset relative to the starting point, it means there is no direct ground underneath the starting point and we have probably hit an edge and should start searching for a possible step off. Because we don't use a navigation mesh for the player, we have no directly available metrics for the shape of the obstacle. Because of this, we have to do some smart shape analysis through another set of collision probes. These multiple collision probes are downward ray casts in front of us with a fixed offset in between. This way we can detect the depth of the obstacle and determine if the obstacle is flat enough to actually stand on. By looking at the height differences of the intersection positions of the ray cast, we can see if we should be stepping onto the obstacle or if we can actually step over it. For a step off, the same logic is applied as a step on. The only difference is that the intersection position should be lower than Aloy's current position. Once the obstacle shape has been analyzed, we store all metrics of the found obstacle, which allows us to choose a matching animation to trigger. Transition selection is based on a scoring system with weighted variables. For each transition, we calculate a score and the transition with the highest score will be triggered. First, we have to make sure the transition is actually possible for the obstacle metrics. Each transition is categorized by an obstacle type, we have normal or climbable, and a vault type, step up, step over, step off. Every transition contains metrics of the corresponding vault motion. Next to that, each transition is allowed in defined ranges, maximum upwards displacement, maximum forwards displacement, etc. Note that these change, uh, ranges can overlap between the various transitions. By comparing the obstacle metrics with the animation metrics, we can select the transition that suits best. And as we prefer climbable vaults over normal vaults, each transition to a climbable obstacle receives a bonus score. <laughs> so having looked at finding a valid vault transition, let's now move on to executing one. As a result of supporting a variable range for each vault transition, we introduced a problem. The obstacle has probably never the exact same metrics as the motion in the animation. So how can we make sure that the transition will match the obstacle and actually intersects with the shape? We use animation warping to solve this problem. Animation warping is the bending and stretching of an animated motion to reach a specific position at a specific time. The advantage of warping is that you don't need a lot of unique animations to cover all cases. Another nice thing is that while warping, the destination position can be adjusted during playback. The image on the slide gives a rough idea of what animation warping does. On the left side you see the original motion and the right shows the warp motion. 
In order to efficiently spread out the warping adjustments over time, we need to know the total remaining displacement at any time in the animation. This will require an analysis of the animation. In Horizon Zero Dawn, all the warping is operating on each axis individually. So consider this graph to be the displacement over time on the forward axis of the trajectory bone relative to the start position. Let's say if our current frame is at the orange dotted line, you can see that the next frame will contain a lot of forward displacement, the frame after that will have almost no forward displacement, and the next after that will have some backwards displacement, etc. By summing up the displacement of the remaining frames, we know our total remaining displacement. To warp this animation, for every frame that's played, we need to add a little bit of extra displacement and rotation. The amount of motion that's added each frame is dependent on the amount of displacement in the animation for that frame and the amount that's still remaining. Calculating the amount of extra displacement that is needed is done by dividing the current displacement by the remaining displacement multiplied by the requested destination displacement. Note that the extra displacement is always pointing in the direction of the requested destination. We improved this basic warping technique with several enhancements that improved the uh, usability and quality of the warp motions a lot. During the warp motions of our vaults, we needed to make sure that the hands are placed exactly on the obstacle shape. To achieve this, we have extended our warping logic to allow any bone to reach the given destination. This is done by calculating the offset of the hand bone to the trajectory bone at any point in the animation and sub subtracts its offset from the destination position. This makes sure the hand bone will end up at the destination position. One note, when using this technique, the trajectory is defined by the motion of the hand bone. Another enhancement that we have implemented is to warp only during specific time ranges. For example, when both feet are still on the ground, you probably don't want to enable the warping yet, as this will introduce foot sliding. This is done by using specific animation events that represents the time window when warping can be applied. Multiple events are allowed in one animation clip. This is a very powerful enhancement to warping and it's very easy to implement. If the animation event isn't active in a frame, we don't take the displacement into account when calculating our remaining displacement. This is illustrated by the graph on the slide. One problem is that sometimes you don't want to reach the destination at the end of the animation, but at a specific time in the animation. We solve this by allowing a user-defined arrival time. The arrival time is indicated by a specific event in the animation. The remaining displacement of the animation used in a warping formula is calculated till the user-defined arrival time. The displacement after this is not affecting the warping, but can be used for post-arrival motion, such as a landing animation. The last enhancement that we have implemented that can really help improving the quality of the warp motion is to preserve the original velocity of the animation. One noticeable problem that is caused by warping an animation is that adding the displacement can cause unnatural speed-ups. We solve this issue by also adjusting the playback speed of the warped animation. To illustrate this, the graph on the slide shows the result of an animation warping to twice its own distance. You can see in the graph, marked with an orange line, that this doubles the velocity. To solve the unnatural speed up, we modify the playback speed to cancel out the speed increase. And in this example case, we playback at half the speed. There are limits to how much faster or slower we can play the animation before it starts looking unnatural as well. Therefore, we let our animators control these on a per animation basis. The use of the animation warping allowed us to turn the vault system into a very versatile system that we used for a lot of different features, such as diving into water, climbing out of water, and grabbing ledges. Here's a short video demonstrating all of these features. We start by triggering a step off. Then there's a step on to a climbable obstacle.
followed by a step on to a normal obstacle. As you can see, all vaulting is triggered automatically. I don't press any buttons for triggering the various vaults. We have various variations. For example, here we have a step over with the left hand, followed by a step over with the right hand. We can dive into water and climb out of water. And of course, all these awesome moves make Aloy really exhausted. So not all obstacles in the world can be vaulted. Sometimes Aloy's only option to cross it is to jump. So let's take a look at how Aloy can jump to the ledges at the other side of this river. I would first like to explain very briefly how we annotate the world with environmental metadata. The world of Horizon is split up in big tiles. Each tile is 512 by 512 meter and currently we have more than 100 of them. Each tile is streamable and 3 by 3 tiles around Aloy's position are always loaded. A single tile contains various environmental metadata. The most common one is probably the collision mesh which in our case is a fairly low detailed one and is available everywhere in the world. It tells us where Aloy can and cannot go. It also provides information about surface materials for impact sounds and effects. Besides that, we have other types of metadata, such as volumes that indicate where you can swim and volumes for defining where Aloy can be installed. We also have information of all the roads in the world, their width, their connections and all of the junctions. But the most important one for the traversal system is that we have annotated geometry that identify traversable routes. All geometry in the world can be, uh, uh, can be annotated by either points or lines. The points or lines can be attached to static geometry but also to dynamic movable geometry. These points or lines form what we call an annotation. The annotation can contain multiple tags, which makes them very abstract and versatile, and in the next slide I will explain why. As all of our geometry is streamable, the annotations will happily stream along with it, and as already mentioned, they provide semantics for various gameplay systems, such as our traversal system. In this image, the red lines highlight the annotations. We use tags to indicate which traversal mechanics are allowed on the annotated geometry. For example, climbable means Aloy can hang with her hands on the annotation and balanceable means Aloy can stand with her feet on it. Unstable means that it should look like that she could fall off at any moment by playing an additive animation. Ziplineable means that she's able to zipline along the annotation. Multiple tags are allowed on a single annotation. Before I continue explaining the traversal mechanics that use these annotations, I would first like to describe how we did set up our jump system, because attaching to one of the annotations often happens from a jump. In Horizon, our jump trajectory is split up in two phases. We have a pre-apex phase, which is animation driven, and we have the post-apex phase, which is code driven. A problem with animation driven movement is that it takes away control of the player. Therefore, we added in-air steering. During the complete takeoff and falling phase, we allow adjustments on the orientation of Aloy, which results in bending the trajectory. By applying dampening on the forward momentum when, uh, momentum when the player lets go of the movement stick, we simulate in-air braking. This improves controllability even more. We are using an animation-driven takeoff to guarantee that the trajectory matches the jump motion. In our previous games, the complete trajectory was co-driven, which made it hard for our animators to create a matching motion for all the different speed ranges. So, with all of these improvements on controllability, you could think that jumping towards a specific destination is now a piece of cake. So, I've prepared a demonstration to see this in action. As you can see, it is still annoyingly difficult for the player to time and predict a jump to end at a specific location. Or at least for an amateur like me. 
So how can we improve this behavior? It would really help if we were able to predict the jump trajectory so we can apply small adjustments to guide the player to a specific traversable destination. One important note is that we absolutely want to maintain the illusion of control. To be able to predict the jump trajectory at runtime, we need to know the full motion of our jump animation. This is why we analyze our animated motion during the offline conversion process and store all the metadata in so-called motion tables. Motion tables are databases of animation metadata for individual animation states. They contain information about how the displacement, speed, time, etc. changes for animation states dependent on the animation variables that affect the animation state. These motion tables are for example used for storing the animation metrics in the vault transitions, as mentioned earlier. In an offline step, we populate our motion table by analyzing the resulting motion of all animation states for all valid permutations of input values. This is quite an expensive task. At runtime, we are able to query the database for a given state with the active runtime animation variables. Based on the active set of animation variables, several stored results are then blended together to form a final resulting set of metadata. Here's a rough example of how that works. This example shows a simple animation state that blends three animations together, depending on two input variables that are set by the game logic. In this case, variables X and Y. The blend node simply a blend two blends two animations together where the weight depends on the input variable. In this case, when X is zero, 100% of A will be blended with 0% of B. And when X is 0.5, A and B will be equally blended. For our motion table, we want to pre-calculate all metrics for our animation state for certain combinations of input values. We are only interested in combinations of input values that make any of the blend nodes choose a single one of its inputs. In this example, we have a total of four input values possible for the two different blend nodes. X can either be 0 or 1, and Y can either be 4 or 8. Because there is no blend node attached to the input value when Y equals 8, we have a total of three combinations possible. So, for these three combinations of input values, the animation metrics are stored in a table. Querying metrics for arbitrary input values is now just a matter of blending the storage results together. By applying the same blending as in the animation network to the values stored in the motion tables, this will result in a valid outcome. So, now that we are able to query the metrics of a jump motion, we can easily calculate the position of our apex by adding the complete displacement from a takeoff animation to the takeoff position. This will be the initial position of the falling phase. The initial velocity of the falling phase will be the velocity of the last frame from the takeoff animation, which is also queried from the motion tables. Using these positions, we can construct a parabolic trajectory as shown on the slide. With the constructed parabolic trajectory, we can now start searching for nearby jump destinations. This is done by gathering all possible targets within a certain radius of Aloy. We iterate over our jump trajectory with a fixed time step to see if a target is reachable at any given moment during the jump. Targets that are above our apex are never reachable because that will look too unnatural. If a target is close enough to our original predicted trajectory, we calculate a scale factor of the parabola by dividing the desired displacement by the original displacement. This way we know how much extra velocity is needed to reach the target. We only allow guiding to targets, targets for which the change of velocity is within an adjustable limit. This makes it very easy for designers to tweak and control the snappiness of the guidance system. The previous slide showed how we could predict the trajectory if the target position was exactly in front of Aloy. But since we support in-air steering, we should also allow some bending of the trajectory to reach a certain destination. We are able to account for this by calculating the required turn speed by constructing a circle that goes through both our current position as our destination position. 
We can do this in 2D since we're only focusing on heading change. By calculating the angle between the vector from the current position to the circle center and the target position to the circle center, divided by the travel time, we have our turn speed. If the desired turn speed is bigger than an adjustable limit, we again don't allow guiding to this destination. The next video will show the jump guidance system in full effect. In this video I will pause the game, press the jump button and then you can see the original trajectory as a white line and the predicted trajectory as a colored line. The green circle is the circle used for calculating our turn speed. You can see it in this top-down view, it's the really big green line. I think I can leap onto the tonic from here. Made it. I should be able to jump onto the tonic from here. The last traversal mechanic that I will explain is our climb system. The world of Horizon is filled with rock walls like this, which Aloy can climb without much of a problem. To give our designers maximum control, Aloy can only climb on annotated geometry. While climbing, she's physically attached to the geometry at a single point. While climbing with hands, this attach point is between the hands. This is also the position where Aloy's trajectory joint is located. When Aloy is standing on an annotation, the attach point is located between the feet. We trigger transitional animations when climbing from one annotation to another. First of all, we look for all nearby destinations and find the one that has the best combination of distance and angle. Then we go through all our possible transition animations. We have more than 100 of them currently. And we find the one whose motion would need the least amount of warping. Each transition has conditions and ranges that we take into account and we also check if the transition motion won't collide with anything. And in the end we will trigger the best transition that we found and warp it to our found destination. During climbing we use IKs on the hand and feet to guide them. For the hands, we always make sure they are placed onto the geometry. This can either be on the current position or when we are performing a transition on the destination position. While climbing, we also continuously check if our feet can be placed against the geometry in front of us. If no geometry is available at the foot position, the IK on the feet can be turned off and we will let the feet dangle. To find the IK rest position, we are using multiple collision probes to find an intersection position. For the hands, we use a slightly tilted probe that goes through the palm of the hands, and for the feet, we use two sets of collision probes to allow Aloy to pull up her legs a bit more. Each of the four limbs can be controlled individually. Our animations control when the hands and feet should be resting on geometry and when not. They have animation events that drive our IKs and also lock the limbs. The next video shows the probing and IKs in action. Here Aloy is hanging with IKs enabled on the hands and feet. The green lines visualize the intersection tests. Now Aloy is hanging without the IKs enabled on the feet. The red lines visualize that there is no valid geometry for our feet to rest against. One of the bigger challenges that we had was the support for climbing on dynamic objects, such as our tall neck. For example, not all assets in our game have the same update frequency. Aloy, for example, is updated at a higher frequency than our tall neck. So when jumping towards a tall neck or climbing on one, we have to compensate the motion of all the tall neck's annotations for this difference in update frequency. Next to that, we also have to correctly apply the motion of the object we are attached to, to Aloy's body. To make sure our feet and hands are placed correctly on the climb asset, the collision probing also needs to be in sync with the desired update frequency. Since tall necks are updated at a much lower frequency, their collision volumes also move at a much lower frequency. 
So Aloy's probing for collision should also be performed at the same lower frequency to stay in sync. Well, that brings us to the end of the final section. Now I would like to emphasize on what we think worked well and what didn't work that well. The abstract text on the annotations that provide semantics for our traversal system allowed us to create a very reliable jump prediction system as well as a very flexible climb system. Because we select climb transitions based on the required displacement needed to reach a destination, the climb system managed to even climb moving dynamic geometry. In the jump guidance system, there are only two variables to tweak, maximum change in velocity and maximum change in turn speed. Therefore, the designers were able to find their desired balance between snappiness versus realism. A guided trajectory also allows us to already anticipate on the landing, making it, making it possible to seamlessly blend to a landing animation that fits the destination, such as a tall neck, zip lines or rock walls, etc. So what didn't work that well? Because most of our traversal system and tools were developed from scratch upon switching from Killzone to Horizon, our level designers initially didn't have the visualization and editor tools to optimize areas for traversability. Our ambition was to have a lot more traversal paths throughout the world than what we ended up shipping with. While the vaulting system eventually worked out fine, it is probably not the best and efficient way to implement it. A big improvement would be to also support the navigation mesh for the player, as this could also solve other problems as well. For example, preventing the player from getting stuck or entering inaccessible areas. Finally, I would like to end by thanking you all for your attention and interest. And if anyone has any questions, I will be pleased to answer them. Hi, thanks for your talk. I wonder um, what of these um, uh, specific features that you uh, described are unique to your game and what are similar to other games featuring complex animations? Um, I, I think, well, there are a lot of games who have similar features like this, like simplining is also done in Tomb Raider, for example. Climbing is also done in Uncharted, so yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's not really a big difference. It's, the big difference is, is how we implemented it, probably. Well, I think um, our vault system is probably unique because we do it physics-based. So it's really dynamic. It's yeah, doing all this collision probing instead of uh, having a navigation mesh or annotated objects uh, for vaulting. Um, so that's probably a unique feature compared to other games. Uh, hi, I was wondering if um, of the of the um, annotations in the animation, like the events and animations and the arrival times and and whatnot, and the um, and also the geometry annotations. How much of that uh, was automated, and how much of it was placed by hand? Did you have any uh, tools for uh, you know just assisting with the with the placement of, of such things like for instance like automatic detection of uh, frames where the feet touch the ground and so on yeah we have some scripts that detect when the feet are on the ground so we also use animation events for footsteps that trigger footstep effects and also sounds uh, those are yeah mostly automated but also tweaked by hand and all the annotations on the geometry are always placed by hand and most of the animation events, like for example the warping, are also placed by hand and also adjusted for the perfect uh, time window. But the footstep events are or can be automated, uh, uh, detected. First of all, great talk, very complete. Um, when you were talking about animation warping, you said that you scale the playback speed of the animation. Uh, how do you calcul uh, calculate the scale? Is it linear or...? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's linear. And like we have adjustable limits and then the animators can control for yeah, how much scaling can be applied before it starts looking unnatural. Because if you scale it down to 20%, the animation plays in slow motion and you definitely don't want to do that. 
Anyone else? I've got one question about the specific situation uh, when Aloy was jumping onto this pole or something and the animation was corrected that she would land on the pole. Was it also annotated by designers that the display is like expected to, to land? Yes. Okay. So on the pole, we have a single point that is an annotated. So that makes sure that Aloy can actually stand on the pole and then jump to the other poles. Okay. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, how many animation clips do you have for the main character for <laughs> this whole system? I don't know. A, a lot. <laughs> really a lot. We also have left foot forward and right foot forward for all the starts animation and the stops animations. And now it's a lot. I really don't know by it. Uh, maybe it's a bit of after pick, but it was still on your side. Uh, you gave us uh, the numbers of the size of the team at the beginning, uh, but how did it grow later on? Uh, no, that was actually like the whole team we had for the complete project, at least for Aloy, for the main character. So we had two programmers, three animators, and then one designer and one producer. But the designer switched. Uh, I think, yeah, we have a total of three designers during the whole project, but there was only one designer constantly working on the traversal system. Okay, I think it's enough. So, thank you, Paul, very much. Huge applause.